So, but you, and then you this is a new record now. Yeah, it's new. No problem. You just you just see the glass. No problem. Okay. Are you comfortable with? This? Yeah. Okay. Let's make sure the the uh, face comes. Yeah. In good. I will. This new. I will not miss. <laughs> <laughs> Trying out the microphones, how amazing. som jag har lagt till och tagit bort. Så det bra. Det är det. 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 Det är det.
Shall we win? Shall we win? Question and answer session. What will we ask questions like that, or is it from your seats or from your hands? I believe from your seats is okay, right? It's okay Fine. from your seats because we got a wireless microphone. So well, that's amazing. Hmm? You can just repeat the questions for the cameras, maybe. Yeah, re repeat the question. Yeah. Are you ready, guys? No, let's go. You're welcome to this uh, debate or dialogue, as I prefer to call it, between Muslim and Christian, on a very important topic the topic of whether the Bible says that Jesus is God or the Son of God or not. And uh, the reason I call this, I prefer to call it a dialogue, is because we're here to learn something today. We're not going to vote someone into office or debate tax, tax deduction or something like that. It's a profound topic. And it's about a person which is loved and daily revered by all of us in this audience, I think. So, uh, <clears throat> let me just talk a little bit about what we're doing here. Since, we have, since this is in the format of a debate, we're going to have some simple rules. And one of them, the most important one, is that we have to keep a person's speech and you know, we keep to the topic. I will just simply respect each other. So I will try to keep time of the speakers when they're speaking so nobody gets too little or too much. And I will try to prevent people from breaking in during the speak. We are going to have a post questions and answer session afterwards. So if you if you like just note down your questions, we will deal with them later. And I will go through the, the uh, rules of how to how that one will run. Um, and I will be the moderator. So I will tell people to stop, stop talking and stop talking and so on. And a lot of that I will not do very much. I will have the people talk and say what they are going to say. So, like I said, I'm going to enforce the rules and I will basically be a timekeeper. So if you hear a strange noise, it's just my cell phone going off with the timing going off. So it's time for someone else to talk. And what's going to happen next is that the speakers are going to be introduced by their associates. And after that, we will have an introductory speech by the speakers. And I'm going to say this only once, but this is going to be so that everybody says, get the chance to speak. So first, Omid will give the introduction, and then Naim will give the introduction. What follows next is a 15 minute presentation on the topic, giving the views of, of, the, of Islam and Christianity. And then the rebuttals or critique starts to come. So we will have 12 minutes for that. And there will also be a reason to answer, uh, an opportunity to answer that for another 12 minutes. And finally, there will be a round of, of rebuttals and answers for another 8 minutes each. Then there will be a couple of minutes of conclusion, and then we'll have a break. And after the break, we'll have a QA and a session, which I will introduce when that happens. So, I'm going to hand over the microphones to, to, to Daniel, was it? Yeah. And he will give an introduction over me. And after, when he's done with that, we'll hand over it to, to I forgot your name. Ibrahim. Ibrahim, who, who will introduce Naim. And then the guys will get a chance to start talking eventually. So,
I'm Daniel, one of the and one elder in Gothenburg International Baptist Church, where Omid is a member, he's one of the preachers in our church, and he became a believer three years ago, and he's working as a science and math teacher, and tonight or today he has the opportunity to represent a Christian position. Presenting the opposing speaker of this um, debate. His name is Mohammed Naim Khan, and he's a mechanical engineer by profession who graduated from the Chalmers University of Technology with a master's degree. Um, he was inspired by PCV lectures and debates by uh, Sheikh Nadidat and Dr. Zakir Naik and other prominent Islamic scholars. Um, his methodology of acquiring knowledge was from the Quran and the narration of Muhammad, the Hadith, basically. Um, he is a student of Islamic comparative religion uh, since years ago uh, and preaching Islam as a peaceful and optimist in his life. He started by Friday sermons in Chalmers University uh, at the beginning of 2008, January, and, at, and in the past years he has done more than 100 sermons over um, Sweden and also in places in Norway. He is the head of the Chalmers Islamic Association, which uh, began in 2008, 2009. He, is, he was also engaging in educational seminars and religious discussions with prominent um, religious characters. Uh, he, as, as, a comparative, as a student of comparative religion, he is well versed on the Bible and also the Vedic scriptures, basically Hindu scriptures. Uh, in recent time, he gave uh, lectures on various topics, such as the concept of God in comparative religion, and also the mention of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Bible and in the Hindu scriptures. He is the head of the uh, Islamic Research Center of Sweden, and also he uh, was engaging in debates with an American priest in September 2009, which alhamdulillah was a grand success, and also a dialogue with a Jewish organization, Center for Muslim and Jewish Engagement. So here you have before you uh, Mr. Naim Khan. Welcome, please. Thank you very much. And give it to Naim. Oh, let's. So, for a need to give this five minutes presentation. Introduction. Well, greetings. I'd like to thank you all for coming here, and especially Naim for engaging us in these most important subjects. Let me start off by saying that I, under no circumstances, want to, in any shape or form, insult the religion of Islam, or any Muslims for that matter. Have it on the microphone, sir. I am sorry. We start off. Sure. I've, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm on. Greetings, everyone, and to all the Muslims in the audience, Assalamu Alaikum. I'd like to start by thanking you all for coming here, and especially Naim for engaging us in this most important subject. Let me start off by saying that I, under no circumstances, want to insult any Muslim or the religion of Islam for that matter. Um, so if I do say anything that is insulting, please forgive me. But I do not apologize for saying the truth, no matter how much it might hurt because that's why I'm here to represent what I believe to be the truth. So what do I believe to be the truth? 
As a Christian, I believe that the purpose of life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But we have separated ourselves from God by sinning. Since God is holy, He accepts no sin, and therefore we can never come to Him. And since God is just, He will judge us for our sins. But God has not left us in this hopeless state. He is our Savior, and He Himself came down to earth for about 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ. Hence we believe that Jesus is God that has added to his divinity a human nature in order to save us from our sins and bring us to God. He has saved us by taking upon himself our sins and the consequences of those sins when he died on the cross. As the perfect human, Jesus is also our high priest, our greatest prophet, our mediator, the model for how we should live our lives, and he is also our brother and friend who in all ways understands us. What I mean by the perfect human is that Jesus was completely human and lived a perfect life. That is, he kept God's law in every aspect. He worshipped God the way God should be worshipped, and he always did God's will. Now someone might wonder, how can Jesus be fully God and at the same time worship God and pray to God? Was he praying to himself? No, Jesus was praying to the Father. Like all humans, Jesus had a God, his Father in heaven. You see, we Christians are monotheists, but we're not Unitarians as Muslims are. We are Trinitarian monotheists. We believe in the triunity of God, that there only exists one God, but that the one God is not one person. The Bible teaches us that the unipersonal view of God, the belief that God is one person, is wrong. The Bible teaches us that the one being of God is shared by three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These persons are fully God, but they are not each other. They are distinct, yet inseparable persons. Hence, Jesus is the Son, who is fully God, but He's not the Father, though they are the same God. So when Jesus took a human body to himself, he continued his relationship with his Father through prayers. Even though they are equal in divinity, through the incarnation, Jesus voluntarily became a servant to his Father so that he could, as a human, redeem mankind. It was for this reason the early church called the Father, in line with Jewish tradition, God, the Greek word theos. And they called Jesus Lord, the Greek word kurios, which was the foremost title God had in the Greek Old Testament. Now, I can spend hours explaining the, God, uh, the doctrine of God's triunity, but that's not what today's debate is about. The subject of today's debate is if Jesus considered himself to be God and nothing else. The incarnation of Christ is explained in Philippians 2, 5-11. There Paul explains how the Son, being fully God, voluntarily humbled himself by taking upon himself a human body. Hence Jesus had a complete experience of what it means to be human, and he couldn't evade this mission by living out his divinity. He was constantly dependent on the Father as his God, and he did everything according to the Father's will, and he had no information or works that the Father had not willed. He was completely human, with his divinity beneath. Now the question is, is this true? Did God love us so much that he himself came down, suffered, and died in the person of Jesus so that we can have eternal life with him? It is my contention in today's debate that this is true. And in my opening statement, I will show why I believe that Jesus agrees with me. Thank you so much for listening to me. You want us to try it with my computer again? No, it's okay.
Yeah, let me try if my computer works. It, it, it shouldn't have to do with that. It's like, it's like okay, it works on mine. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Uh, it it worked a second ago. I think it's okay if we escape. Uh, it was working at the moment. Yeah, it was working just a second ago. It has to be something with this computer because. Uh, I have a USB so I can transfer the file to your presentation. Let's try this out. You can hear yeah. this one. Yeah, let's see. Let's try this Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, you get your USB? Uh, yes. But I think we can escape because it's just consuming time. So. Okay, you're going to do it for that? Take it, take it. Oh, you want? Okay. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, we are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. I begin by praising Allah, the creator of the heaven and the earth. We seek Allah's forgiveness for our shortcomings, and I seek that Allah to guide us to the truth through the discussion. Verily, whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And if God Almighty leaves someone astray, there is no one who can show him. <coughs> and I bear witness that there is no one is worthy to be worshipped except Allah. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger of God sent to humanity. Before I dwell into the subject, my Mr. Chairman and my dear brother, I welcome all of you with this uh, debate of this afternoon with the Islamic greeting, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Meaning, may peace, mercy, and blessings of God be on all of you who receive the guidance. To proceed, the subject is, did Jesus consider himself to be God, according to the Bible? So, before I proceed into the subject, I would like to make certain points very clear to my Christian audiences. That Islam is the only non-Christian faith on the face of the earth, which makes it, in its article of faith, to believe in Jesus Christ is their own. 
No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Christ. Peace be upon him. And uh, we believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God sent to the people of Bani Israel. But the different shifts comes when it comes to the understanding of the Christians and understanding of the Muslims in terms of the title of the debate. Is he God? As my friend was trying to deliver that he is the incarnation in so many words, which inshallah by God will, in the next sessions we will discuss elaborately, how can he cannot be a God? He was what he claimed. As a Muslim, our position is very clear in the Quran. We believe that he was the Messiah. His original name was Isha, a Heshwa, or Messiah was his title, which is translated as a, as a Jesus Christ. My position as a Muslim is very clear. The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 32, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْنَصِيبِ لِمَرِيَمَ They are doing an act of disbelief who says that Jesus, the son of Mary, is God Almighty. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحِ But said the Christ, يَا بَنِ إِزْرَائِلِ O children of Israel, أَعْبِدُ اللَّهِ Worship Allah, رَبِّي وَرَبَّكُمْ Who is my Lord and your Lord. إِنَّ هُمَا يُشْرِكِ بِاللَّهِ If you associate anyone with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ الْجَنَّةِ The paradise is forbidden for you. وَمَا وَهُمْ نَارِ وَمَا نِزْظَلِمِنَ مِنَ الْعَمْسَارِ And the heaven is forbidden for you and for you is a great torment. In order to support that, we Muslims are forced to use the Bible. We will discuss later what is the Bible itself. But for a reference, we are using the Christian's book of authority to present that, look, Jesus, he was born 2,000 years ago. As we believe, God never born. Jesus himself claimed that he is an approved man of God. He prayed to God, as my brother says already. But he ate, he slept, he behaved like every one of us. According to the understanding of the human being, human and God are different. So, according to the statement of Jesus himself in the Bible, he claimed that he is an approved man of God by wonders and miracles which God did by him in the book of Acts. It is very clear in Jesus' own statement, John 4.25, that God is the spirit and truth. So whosoever worship God should worship him in truth and in his spirit, not in form or shape or any form. And after all of his preaching in the little time he got, he was telling to his disciples, are you yet without understanding? Says Matthew 15. Thank so, you very much. Then five minutes have passed. So I will explain to you in details in the course of talk that he was a mightiest messenger and he was an approved man of God. So now we're going to have the main presentation and as I said earlier, it's Omid who will give that one first. And it will run for 15 minutes. I'll let it be here in case you want to use it. Okay. So what made the Jews of Jesus' time, who believed in a jealous God, a God that shares his glory with no one, that punishes every form of idolatry, what made these Jews that twice every day repeated the Shema, that there exists only one Lord God, what made these strict monotheistic Jews start worshipping Jesus and calling him God? The followers of Jesus called Jesus our great God and Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords, the author of life, creator and sustainer of all things, and said that he has the name above all names, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, both in heaven and on earth, confessing him Lord. What made strict monotheistic Jews believe the inconceivable, that Jesus is God? It is my contention in today's debate that the reason is that Jesus identified himself as God. And to prove that Jesus considered himself God, I will present three arguments and for every argument give four evidences. Argument number one, Jesus accepted honor only due to God. The main reason why Jesus must be God 
uh, can be explained by following syllogism. A. According to the Bible, humanity is created for the glory of God, Isaiah 43, 6-7. B. According to the same Bible, we are going to honor and praise Jesus for all eternity as our Savior and King, 1 Peter 4, 11. Hence, C. Jesus must be God. You see, if God had used a creature to save us, give us eternal life and be our King, then we would be for all eternity grateful towards that creature and praise and honor Him. But the Bible makes it clear that God shares His glory with no one, Isaiah 42a, that He's our only Savior, Isaiah 43:11, that and that He's our heavenly King. Therefore, if Jesus accepted honor only due to God, that can only mean that Jesus is God. And here are four evidences that Jesus accepted honor only due to God. Evidence one, Jesus accepted worship. In Matthew 28, we read two incidences where the reason Jesus is worshipped. In verse 9 we read, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Verse 17, And they, when they saw him, that is Jesus, they worshipped him. Had Jesus not been God, he would have definitely rebuked them and told them to worship God alone. But instead, Jesus accepts their worship, which is evident by his divine claim in verse 18, when Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus claims to have all authority, not only on earth, but even in heaven, something only God has. Then he says that he always is with all of his followers to the end of time, meaning he's omnipresent. In summary, we see Jesus accepting worship, considering himself Lord of heaven and earth, and omnipresent. We therefore see Jesus considering himself to be God. Evidence 2. Jesus should be honored as God. In John 5, 22-23, Jesus says, The Father judges no one, but has given all the judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. If you recall from Isaiah 42, 8, God doesn't share His glory with anyone. But Jesus says that you should honor Him just as you honor the Father. Meaning, He should be honored as God. In Matthew 21, 15-16, we see this in practice. There the chief priests are complaining to Jesus because children were praising him. Jesus answered them, Yes, have you never heard? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. This is a quotation from Psalm 8, 1-2 about praising Jehovah God. But Jesus used it of himself. So Jesus told people to honor him as God and he considered it right when they did. And this is because Jesus is God. Evidence 3. Jesus has the name above all names. In John 14, 26, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Jesus says that Almighty God does something in his name. In Jesus' day, you never ever invoked the name of a lesser authority. For example, you never said, I come here in the name of my dog. That's just silly. You always invoke the name of a higher authority. For example, I come here in the name of Caesar. Jesus claims, by claiming that Almighty God does something in His name, Jesus claimed to be equal to God in terms of authority. Hence, Jesus considered Himself to be God. Evidence 4. Jesus is the object of faith. According to the Old Testament, God alone is the object of faith. But in the New Testament, Jesus makes Himself the object of faith. Let's look at some examples. Isaiah 43.10 God proclaims himself as the object of faith, saying, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Jesus, uh, jo John 8, 24, Jesus says, Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Same way God points to himself, Jesus points to himself. Knowing that the psalmist writes in Psalm 42, 2, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Jesus says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Jesus in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. 
whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus clearly makes himself the focal point of faith, something only God is, hence Jesus must be God. Argument number two, Jesus identifies himself as God. And here are my four evidences for this. My first evidence comes from John 8, 56 to 58. In verse 56, Jesus says, Jesus says to the Jewish leaders, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews answered him, You're not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Whereby Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. After this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. What had Jesus done? Jesus had called himself, I am, a title for God. Several times in the Old Testament, God refers to himself as I am. We saw one earlier in Isaiah 43, 10. Another one is from Exodus 3, 14, where Moses asks God who he is, and God answers Moses saying, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. By claiming to be I, I, I am, a title for God, Jesus identified himself as God. My second evidence comes from Mark 14, 61 to 65. Here Jesus is on trial and the high priest asks him, Are you Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus responds, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This statement made the high priest tear his clothes and consider Jesus guilty of death for blasphemy. Why? Because Jesus had identified himself as the Son of Man in Daniel 7, 13-14. There the prophet Daniel saw a vision of a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, who, quote, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve the word that is Kalach, serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. This Son of Man was divine because he was to be worshipped with the highest form of religious worship, the word Palach, by the entire world. And he's a glorious king with an everlasting kingdom. So when Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, he was claiming to be a co-occupant of God's throne and the Son of Man who everyone on earth is going to worship as God. And the Jews understood that Jesus identified himself as God. My third evidence comes from Revelation 170. Another title that only belongs to God is the first and the last. For example, in Isaiah 44, 6, God says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Interesting enough, the Quran agrees. Surah 57, 3. He, Allah, is the first and the last. But in Revelation 1.17, Jesus says, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Again, by claiming to be the first and the last, Jesus identifies himself as God. Four, Jesus considered himself to be our God. John 20.28, 20, here this is disciple Thomas sees the risen Jesus and says to him, My Lord and my God. Had Jesus not been God, he would have definitely rebuked Thomas and, uh, and said to him to words, uh, and, Accuse him for blasphemy. But instead we see the opposite. Jesus responds to Thomas by saying, Now you believe. So Jesus considered Thomas' statement to be a statement of true faith. Therefore, Jesus considered himself to be God. <clears throat> Argument number three. Jesus has attributes belonging to God alone. And my four evidences are the following. The first one is the forgiver of sins. The Bible makes it clear that only God can forgive sins, since he's the owner of everything and all sins are ultimately offenses committed against him. Psalm 51, 4, Isaiah 43, 25, Micah 7, 18. But many times in the gospel, we see Jesus forgiving people their sins. Mark 2, 5 to 10, Luke 7, 36 to 50, Matthew 9, 1, uh, 1 to 8. Jesus, by personal grace, changed people's eternal destinies. Hence, we have the following. A. Only God has the right to forgive sins. B. Jesus forgave sins. Therefore, C. Jesus must be God. My second evidence, the judge of the world. According to the Old Testament and the Quran, Surah 6, 114, 18, 26, God is the judge of all mankind. 
We read this throughout the Old Testament, Genesis 18:25, Psalm 7:11, Isaiah 49-11. But Jesus claims several times that he is the judge of all mankind. We saw one example earlier in John 5:22. Another is from Matthew 16:27. Jesus says, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Notice four things here. According to Isaiah 32, 8, God shares his glory with no one. And yet Jesus says that he comes in God's glory. Two, Jesus owns angels. Three, in order for Jesus to repay everyone according to what they've done, Jesus must be all-knowing. And four, Jesus is the one that decides everybody's eternal destiny. Hence, we have the following. A, God is the judge of all mankind. B, Jesus is the judge of all mankind, therefore C, Jesus is God. My third evidence is the object of prayer. Jesus says we can pray to him and he will answer us. In John 14, 13 to 40, read, read Jesus saying, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. In order for Jesus to answer prayers, he must be omnipresent, he must be all-knowing and almighty so he can hear everyone and be able to answer them. So, A, only God has the attributes to answer prayers. B, Jesus says you can pray to him and that he will answer. And C, Jesus must be God. My fourth evidence, the owner of everything. Of course God owns everything. Yet Jesus claims that he, by divine right, owns everything that belongs to God. John 16, 15, all that the Father has is mine. John 17, 10, all mine are yours and yours are mine. And in Mark 12, 1 to 9, Jesus even gives a parable where he distinguishes himself from all the prophets who are God's servants and calls himself the heir of God's kingdom because he's God's son. Since God owns everything, that means that Jesus owns everything. We have the following. A. God owns everything. B. Everything that God owns belongs to Jesus. Therefore, C. Jesus must be God. In conclusion then, we have seen three arguments, twelve evidence total, for Jesus considering himself to be God. These arguments could no mere Rasul ever say the things that Jesus says. First, Jesus accepted honor only due to God. Two, Jesus identified himself as God. And three, Jesus has attributes that only God has. If Naim wishes to show that Jesus did not consider himself to be God, he must break down all my arguments and erect a case of his own. Until or unless he has done so, we shall accept the fact that Jesus indeed considered himself to be God. Thank you so much for listening to me. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina wa ba'd. Mr. Chairman, dear brother, as my dear opponent was trying very hard in order to prove with the maybe we need to turn on the mic, please. Microphone, yes. With the 14 evidences to support his three arguments. But the thing is that in order for us to understand someone as a God, it has to be someone with the characteristics of God. So if your understanding is wrong, what is God, then we can make every Tom, Dick and Harry as God. For example, I will show some of the evidences for you that the world, God, these are the gods of the world that presently believe. You know, the Rama, people believe about his incarnate, that he is the seventh incarnation of God. This is the little child in the corner. He's a young child and he becomes old. Then there is this monkey. The people believe more than 1.5 billion people in India, they believe he is God incarnate. The other people believe that Buddha is the God, 
The snake is the God, the elephant is the God, every dog, pig and donkey is the God. And some of the Christians, this is not by the Muslims, in the picture, supposed to be the picture of Jesus and Rama and their God, they are flying together. For a Hindu, this belief is something that is very common. They believe about everything is God. But for a monotheistic people, like the Jews and Christians and Muslims, is something different. He was telling that the Jew, Jews' understanding of Jesus, that they were seeing a God. The Jesus, peace be upon him, whom we Muslims cannot pronounce his name without this form of honor. Peace be upon him. So, what is God? Because Jesus is telling again and again. He was quoting about Thomas, saying, my God, my Lord, and I am. Just show me anywhere in this Roman Catholic Bible, which has 73 books, supposed to be the book of God, and this Protestant Bible of 66 books, where Jesus himself says, himself says, look, man, in plain language, I am God and worship me. If someone misunderstands him and worship him as a God, that's why he says, are you yet without understanding? Are you yet without understanding? You men of little faith, you, a generation of vipers, who is he talking? Their understanding was different. So, the correct concept of God is in the Old Testament. No Jew is prepared to believe any man incarnate as God, or God incarnate as a man. Read at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. God of Moses, peace be upon him, he was telling the God, uh, the people, that Shama Israel, Hear Israel, our Lord, our God is one. In the Isaiah, my friend has put it very fast before you understand what is going on. God Almighty says that there is no savior except me. This is true. He also quoting the Quran. I don't know how much Quran he knows. He was just quoting from here and there. There were some phrases what fitted his support. But there is no verses in the Quran which supports his agreement that Jesus is God. God Almighty is telling in the book of Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5, that there is no God beside me. If he, God Almighty is a God, God the Father, and if he has another God, as he was showing in the level, the level of Father is here and the level of Son is here, that another God beside God is there, then God Almighty was supposed to say, look, <laughs> I am God and there is none like me. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ came along. He was a reformer among the Jews. So he was reforming their faith because the Jews, they went to the letter of the law and they forgot the spirit. So Jesus Christ, he was asked by a learned Jew, you have said us so many things. But what is the first commandment of all? And Mark chapter 12, verse 29, he repeated the same word as it was pronounced by Moses, peace be upon him, 13th century before him. The Shama Israelo, Adnai Hilahaino, Adnai Echa. Hear, O Israel, listen to this. Our Lord, our Lord, our God is one Lord. Who is He? Then we have to understand. Jesus says God is truth and God is His Spirit. And John, Saint John, according to the statement of Jesus, how you can prove this? See yourself being user rationality. Jesus says you have neither seen His form nor neither you have heard His voice. Who is this He? As the Christians, they will say this is God. You have neither seen the form of God and you have neither heard his voices. The disciples were there. Were they seeing Jesus as a God and listening his voice? And Jesus is telling you have neither heard his voice nor seen his form. The difference between God and Jesus is described in the Bible. You see, Father, Lord and God used by Jesus, peace be upon him, as a synonymous term to refer to God Almighty. It's a synonymous term. So when he says, in John 14, 20, my Lord or my God or my Father is greater than I. Use any term, my Father is greater than I. John 10, my Father is greater than all. Who is he referring to? His mission. See, his mission was to declare himself as a God. Show me where he says, I am God. Contrary to that, he says, this is life eternal. You want to go to heaven? This is life eternal. That they may believe, that you may believe the only true God 
which is in heaven, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Who is sending Jesus? God Almighty. For what purpose? So that the people may believe that God is truth and God is his spirit, and Jesus Christ is a messenger of God. John 14, 24. And the word that you hear is not from mine, but the Father who has sent me. Who sent Jesus? Is God Almighty. Forget about the title Father, but the Lord who has sent me. Because this is a synonymous term. You have to correct your understanding, not by translating the Bible how you like. My brother was using some of the Greek and Hebrew phrase. Do you know the word in Greek and Hebrew for God? Jesus, his mother tongue was Hebrew and Aramaic. The Bible that is recorded in the early manuscript is in Greek translation of his own words. Even his name, he never heard his name Jesus in his lifetime. Christ is a translation, Greek translation of it, the Hebrew word Messiah. Like the word Bible is no word appeared in the Bible. So Jesus says that where he had heard these things, the creator in the Quran, you see in order for you to understand now, you want to understand God. So where do you learn? The true revelation of God Almighty is the Quran. You have here the Old and New Testament and you have your Final Testament. So in order for you to reflect and understand, you need a correct understanding of God. So only one chapter, four verses. Four verses. The touchstone of theology. The concept of God in four verses. What does it say? Qul wallahu ahad. Say he is Allah. The one and only. Allah samad. He is the absolute. He is the eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Neither he beget nor is he begotten. And there is nothing whatever like unto him. God and man are two separate and distinct entities. They two cannot be equal. God is immortal. As I was showing, see, the primitive man have a different understanding of God. Jesus, he used to worship God. And my friend was telling that, oh, he has a different position now from God. If you are a messenger of God, read and you are God Almighty, all power has given to you, and you are crying to God for help. You are the God Almighty. Imagine in your eyes the Roman soldier who was punching Jesus. And, and he was telling the command, prophesy thy name. This soldier, does he ever imagine that he was hitting his God? Imagine yourself. And Jesus was crying to God, Oh my Father, Oh my Lord, let this difficulty pass away from me. Not as my will, but as thou will. Not my will, God Almighty, he don't have any will. No, as a messenger, he don't have any will. He is bound to follow the will of God. So, John 5.30, Jesus proclaimed that I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my will, but the will of my Father who has sent me. Look at his followers, the disciples. My brother was telling me his disciple was praying him as Lord. If they misunderstood, then Jesus was telling him, them, are you yet without understanding? And they all misunderstood. His preaching was for hardly for three years. At the age of 30, he was supposed to start preaching. And before 33, the, according to the Christendom, they, he was put onto the cross and he was crucified. God being crucified in the cross, a God being crucified, a God is dying, a God is taking all this hammer. Regarding the original sins, as my brother was telling, I will describe it in the rebuttal, inshallah. Fasting and prayer performed by Jesus. Peace be upon him. God Almighty is fasting, you know, the Ramadan, the holy month for the Muslims is coming. We will fast and we know what is called hunger. Have you ever imagined a hungry God? Jesus was hungry and he was fasting, he was praying to God. If he is the God, what kind of definition are you giving to God? In nowhere in the Bible that's fit as, 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 a, as a God. In nowhere in, in monotheism any man fit as the quality of God. So Jesus went in a mountainside and prayed the whole night. The Muslims pray sometimes the whole night. Prayer on life is the prayer of the nights. As a messenger of God, he is a higher among us. So he was praying to God Almighty. He was asking for help. He was asking for revolution to come to him, to teach the people so they then believe. God cannot be tempted, we are saying in the Bible. In James chapter 1, verse 13. And immediately in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, we find 
that Jesus was tempted. Can you ever imagine in your thought, the devil who was tempting Jesus, did the devil have a thought that he was tempting his God, if he is the God Almighty? And God can be tempted. The Bible says God cannot be tempted. And Jesus, peace be upon him, he was a prophet. Look at the people, what they say. The Jews, a great prophet have arisen among us. Jesus says, I am an approved man of God among your midst, which God, all the miracles did by him. So, in so many words, my dear brothers, he was commanded by God Almighty to perform all the things that what he did. But the Christians, in so many words, they try to take him away from a position of a prophet and they would like him to worship as God. He never claimed such a things. He even refuted to the suggestions to being as a God. He says, keep the commandment. Keep the commandment. A commandment is our Father, our Lord, our God is one. And nothing like God can be seen, says the Quran in Islam. Our imagination cannot imagine God. No imagination can imagine God in this creation of God. Creation and creator are two separate entities and create, creator is above and beyond the creation. We created this hall and we, our properties and this lecture hall are not the same. And it cannot be the same. And no man can see God at any time, says Timothy and also Exodus. No man can see God and still alive. How can disciples were seeing Jesus and they were seeing a God? This cannot fit, so the Bible refers to that. Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. I would end with that, that the deaf and the dumb, there will be someone who sees but see not. Hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Are you yet without understanding? Dear brothers, open up your mind, open up your hearts, and accept the fact that Jesus was a mighty messenger. He was created like you and I have created, like every dog, pig, and donkey is created. And God Almighty, I would end with the verse of the Quran, which explicitly tells to the people of the world what to believe. And especially it refers to the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. Ya al kitab, O people of the book, la ta'ulu fi dinikum. Do not go to extreme in your religion. Wala ta'ulu ala Allah illa al haq. Do not say any lie against Allah except what is truth. Inna mal masih, most certainly Messiah, translated Christ, is a servant, is a messenger of God. <coughs> And you should desist to, his, to his say Trinity, and it is better for you. And Allah is above everything that what you have mentioned about him. He is not the one who procreate. He is above the creation. This is what is human nature. So I wish, inshallah, in the following talks and the rebuttal and criticism, we will explain to my brothers and dear brethren that Jesus Christ is a mighty messenger and a man a proof of God, God Almighty, is beyond our imagination. We just have to believe Him as what He says in the scripture. No vision can grasp God, and God Almighty has no form like we can imagine. Thank you very much for the presentations. Did everyone hear him? Yeah. yeah. So now we're going to go over to the rebuttals, and the first round will be 12 minutes long, and of course, Start to buy for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naim, for that engaging opening statement. What Naim has done is to take verses completely out of context and distort scripture, something that is easy. I must now put the verses in context and accurately present the message of the text, something that takes much more time, so I have to try to speak as fast as I can to refute as many arguments as I can, uh, so that everyone, but I want to say everyone, don't just look at the arguments. But also ask yourself why one side is misrepresenting the facts, taking verses out of context. So let's start. He brought up, why didn't Jesus say, I'm God, worship me? Well, I got six reasons for that. Five of them are the following. First of all, Jesus did identify himself as God. I showed it and he accepted worship. So the argument is just worthless semantics. 
2. The term God Theos represents the Father. Had Jesus used that term of himself, then he would have identified himself as the Father or another God, which is wrong. 3. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. That's why we often see Jesus forbidding people to reveal his identity. It's not a good idea going around telling people, I'm God, worship me, if the purpose for you coming to earth is to give your life as a ransom and serve people. The argument for, the argument goes both ways. Why didn't Jesus deny his deity? He was often accused of making himself equal with God. If he wasn't, then he should have denied such a thing, which he never did. Five, why do Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah? He said that I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He shouldn't believe that because Jesus never ever said, I am the Messiah, neither in the Bible nor the Quran. So you're inconsistent. Then he brings up John 5, 19 or 30, I don't remember exactly, Jesus, where Jesus says, I can do nothing on myself. Okay, let's put the verse in context. Beginning at verse 17, then we will see that Jesus is God. In verse 17, Jesus claims to have the right that only God has, namely to work on the Sabbath. Then in verse 18, the Jews understood that he was making himself equal with God. So Jesus answers them in verse 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Let me repeat that last part. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. What does Jesus mean by that? Let's look at the context. Jesus says in verse 25 that he gives life to whom he wills. But according to the Old Testament, only God can give life. Deuteronomy 32, 39. So Jesus is claiming to be God here. Jesus continues in verse 22 by saying that he's the judge of mankind. But according to the Old Testament, only God is the judge of mankind. So again, Jesus is claiming to be God. Then Jesus says in verse 25 that he's the one that raises the dead with his voice. Clearly this is something only God does. 1 Samuel 2, 6. Uh, Psalm 49 and the Quran of Greece, Surah 22, 6 to 7. So Jesus again is claiming to be God here, Naim. Then in verse 26, Jesus says that he has life in himself just as the Father has life in himself. Jesus' life is as self sufficient as God's life. So again, Jesus is claiming to be God. And of course, verse 23, where Jesus says, says that everyone must honor him just as they honor the Father. Jesus demands honor due to God alone. Jesus is God. That was the context. Now we see, now that we see in the context, Jesus clearly claims to be God. What did Jesus mean by, by himself? He can do nothing, but he does whatever the Father does. Jesus is explaining the Trinity, namely that the Father and the Son are the same God. Therefore, the Son never does something alone, but everything in union with the Father. Jesus is not a rebel God that does things contrary to the Father's will. He's the same God as the Father. This is evident from the fact that Jesus said that whatever the Father does, he does likewise. Because Jesus is divine, he's able to do everything that the Father does. You must be divine in order to do everything God does, such as give eternal life to whomever he chooses, resurrect the dead from the tombs uh, at the last day by the sound of his voice. So clearly, in context, Jesus is showing his divinity within the Trinity. He brought up John 5, 34, uh, 7, where he says that no one has seen God, but people have seen Jesus. But first of all, Jesus says no one has seen the Father. But there are many places in the Old Testament where people have seen God. Abraham saw God in Genesis 18. Micah saw God in 1 Kings 22, 19. Isaiah saw God in Isaiah 6, 1 to 5. And Daniel saw God. If no one has seen the, uh, the Father, who is this God that these prophets see? Jesus is the God they saw. Even John claims that Jesus was the God Isaiah saw in John 12, 45, 41. So the God that these prophets saw was Jesus. Jesus is God. He brought up John 7, 3, the fall where Jesus says, this is, the, uh, true, this is eternal life, to know you, the one true God. And of course Jesus believed, like all Christians do, that there only exists one God and the Father is God. Saying exclusive statements about one person that the Godhead does not exclude the other persons of the Godhead because they are the same God. For example, Jesus is called our only Lord and Master in Jude 4. But of course Jude considered the Father to also be Lord and Master. Since Jesus shared the nature of the Father and the Father is the one true God, that must mean that Jesus is also the one true God. This is precisely what we Trinitarians believe, so we have no problem with this verse. But now let's look at the verse in context so we see how it disproves Islam. Verse 1, Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Who is this that wants God to glorify him? Verse 2, Jesus says, since you have given him authority over all flesh, does Jesus have authority over every living thing? 
That makes him God. Continuing in verse 2. To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. According to the Old Testament, only God gives eternal life. Verse 7 to 6. But Jesus claims that he's the one who gives eternal life. So Jesus is again claiming to be God. Verse 5, Jesus says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Before there was a world, Jesus existed together with the Father and was in a glorified state and commands God to glorify him again. Then, then verse 10, Jesus said, All mine are yours and yours are mine. And this shows that Jesus owns everything which the Father owns. That means that Jesus is God. So in context, we have seen that Jesus existed before the world was created. He has authority over all flesh. He owns everything. He gives eternal life. And clearly, that means he's God. He brought up John 10, 10 29, where Jesus says the Father is greater than all. Of course the Father is greater than all. Every Christian believes that. Now let's look at the verse in context. In the preceding verses, verse 27, 28, Jesus says the following. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus says that he's the one that gives eternal life, and there is none in creation that is more powerful than him. Jesus is actually likening himself to Jehovah God, who in Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. So Jesus claims to have properties only God has, so Jesus claims it to be God in this passage as well. Then Jesus continues saying, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus saying that he can guarantee his followers eternal destiny because no one is mightier than him and his Father. Jesus was putting himself in the same level as his Father in terms of power. And the Jews understood that he was making himself equal with God. Read verse 33. So this passage also proves Jesus' deity. Then he said that you don't know about anything about the Quran. According to the Quran, Jesus is not God. Really? Let's look at it. Surah 22, 6. Allah is the truth and the life. al haq John, John 14, 6. Jesus says he is the truth and the life. Surah 3, 189. To Allah belong the dominion of the heavens and earth. And Allah has power over all things. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus says he has authority both in heaven and on earth. Surah 40, 68. It is Allah who gives life to the dead. John 5, 25. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming. And is now here when the dead will hear the sound of the the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So clearly, Jesus is Allah here. Surah 3, 9. O oh Lord, thou art that will gather mankind together against the day about which there is no doubt. Jesus, in Matthew 25, 31 to 34. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and with all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and before him he will gather all the nations. Jesus is precisely the same way Allah is the judge of all mankind. Jesus is the judge of all mankind. Surah 24, 35, Allah is the light of heavens and earth. Jesus, in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Surah 3, 135, who can forgive sins but except Allah? Well, Jesus did, and he can do it, so he is God, even according to the Quran. He brought up the Shema, Mark 12, 29, uh, that there only exists one Lord, God. Of course there only exists one God. Christians are monotheists. We believe that there exists one God, but that the one being of God is shared by three persons. And this passage proves it. Right after saying that there only exists one Lord God, Jesus says the following in verse 35 to 37. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declares, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand side until I put your uh, enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? Jesus is showing that the Messiah, even though he's fully human, that is David's son, he is also David's Lord and a co-occupant of God's throne. So the Messiah is God. Remember, the Shema said there only exists one Lord. The Messiah is Lord. That makes the Messiah Jesus God. And before saying the Shema, in Mark 12, 1 to 9, Jesus even gives a parable where he distinguishes himself from the prophets who are God's servants and calls himself the heir of God's kingdom. Meaning that Jesus owns everything that belongs to God. So again, we see Jesus is God. Then, there is also one, another way this passage proves Jesus' divinity. Jesus not only mentions the Shema, but also continues in verse 30 by saying, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Elsewhere, Jesus says, Anyone who loves his father more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his daughter more than me 
is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus made many similar statements. Hence we have the following. A. We should love God with all our hearts. B. We should love Jesus with all our hearts. And C. Jesus is God. He brought up um, John 14, 24, where Jesus says, My words are not mine. They come from the Father. Let's look at the context, beginning at verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he's the one who loves me. If anybody loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. From this text, we learn three things. First, Christ calls the Father's words and commandments commandments for his own words and commandments. No prophet has ever said that God's words and commandments are his or her hers commandments. But Jesus does because he's God. Two, Jesus says that he will dwell all believers in the same way God does, meaning that Jesus is omnipresent, hence he's God. Three, Jesus says that his father's home is his home. Of course, this is symbolic, but still Jesus says our home. Who can do that but God alone? So this verse also shows, guys, trying unity, how the Son and the Father are saying God. Now, I don't have enough time to go re refute more of his points, but I want you to notice how he took verses completely out of context, but when I put them in context, they clearly show that Jesus is God. And I want him to explain why he took verses out of context. Thank you. Yes, my dear brothers. I think my brother went too much excitation until I asked him to show that if there is a single unequivocal statement, unambiguous statement in the complete Bible where Jesus, he himself says, I am God. In so many words, he was trying to show that Quran says <coughs> that Jesus is God. If you notice him, he was showing a verse from the Quran and he was fasting to prove from the Bible. Quran says Allah is the Nur in Surah An-Nur chapter 24. So he was showing from the Bible that Jesus is Nur. If you ask a Muslim, he accepted that yes, every messenger, Nur means the light of truth. Every messenger is the light of truth because they carry the message of God. The Christians, they understood the concept of God. They understood the concept of messengers itself. And they under, misunderstood the concept of message. What does it say? So the Quran says, if you read Surah Tul Imran, chapter 3, verse 71, that, O oh, people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, why you mix truth with falsehood? How many times he was trying to prove that Jesus is God, he was trying to have a conclusion by of his own word. If someone worships Jesus, that means he is God. If Jesus says, I and my father are one, I am quoting out of context, he said, I am quoting out of context. Jesus says that my sheep follow my word. What does he mean by sheep? It is in the context. If you take literal context, sheep means, you know, the animal sheep. He doesn't refer to the animal sheep. And the verse he was quoting, he was stopped. I and my father are one. Why he don't go beyond? I'm referring to John 10, 30. Go beyond. So the Jews, you see, about Thomas, I will clarify the misconception about Thomas, about the Jews, about I and my father are one, Alpha and Omega. He is a mathematic teacher and a teacher of science. Alpha and Omega, ambiguous word. Jesus was the beginning and the end. When he was born, ask the Christians, they will ask 2,000 years ago. Did God born 2,000 years ago? And you say, he's the beginning and the end. How it comes, he was in the womb of Mary, mother. His mother, peace be upon her. So God began in the womb, the women who saw the nursing of Mary, peace be upon her. Was there thinking that this is a God she has just delivered? And that, you know, he was circumcised in the eighth day. Jesus, a God, literally in the... Uh, mind of the Christians, God is a man. You know, he was talking about Trinity. <coughs> See, these, these three pictures we have in our mind, when you talk about Trinity, the Father is an old man, a man. Son is a man, a Spirit is a Spirit. They cannot put figure on the Spirit because they don't have a definition. 
Does the Father look like the Son? You, my dear brothers and sisters, you know how you procreated son and daughters. Does God do that? That's what the Quran, it reflects. You see, it says in Surah Al-Maidah, chapter 5, verse 72, that Mal Masih ibn Maryama illa Rasulullah, that most certainly Jesus, the son of Mary, is the messenger of God. Wa ummuhu siddiqa, and his mother was a righteous one. Both of them, they ate food. Unzur, have a look. <coughs> How you have deviated from the truth. My dear brothers, let's listen to a joke. You see the picture. These are aborigines of the Australia. 2,000 years, they are out of uh, civilization. They have a concept of God. Not like Rama, as what you've seen, not like Krishna, not Buddha, not Jesus. Uh, hardly when you listen to this, you will understand. If you ask this primitive man living in Australia 2000, for 2000 years, they are beyond civilization. What is your concept of God? They will, test, they will ask you a further question because they have defined what can be God and what cannot be God. So they will ask us the questions. Because the missionary have a responsibility, as he, he was telling my brother, that go and preach the gospel to the world. So I would insist the Gutenberg Baptist Church to go there and preach these brothers and sisters uh, to preach the gospels and to preach that Jesus was God. They will immediately ask you a question. That is the God you are referring, is he Atnatu? Is he Atnatu? You see the word Atnatu. What does mean the Atnatu? If you say the Hindus, that look, God Almighty is Rama. He will ask the same question. Is he Atnatu? Now everybody is scared. What does it mean by Atnatu? You know, they have a definition. He's not coconut. He's riding a coconut tree. It's not coconut what he's talking about. The primitive man, they say, look, if God Almighty have the anus, if he eat, he excrete. If that is what you are referring to, food sack from here. Food sack from here. So if you say, Jesus is God, they will say, is he Atnatu? And if you say yes, come on, put say. If you say Rama is God, and he will immediately ask you, is he Atnatu? Does he eat an excrete? If you say yes, come on, put say, man. The primitive men have a better concept of God than the concept of God that Christianity had. Look, Jesus, he ate, he slept, he was fatigued, he was feared, he was fearing death, he was moving around. He was slapping by the people. He was charging by the Jews. Is this the condition of a God? God Almighty put himself to that kind of humiliation to take out the sins of what we are committing? Now, try to use the rational understanding. See, he was quoting Quran and he was showing some things that is fabulous, remarkable. Showing Quran, the Quran says, Allah is the Lord, and he says, Jesus is the Lord. See, Every prophet have eternal life. He was talking about eternal life. Jesus can give eternal life. Every prophet during his time, his law from God is the eternal life. The people who lived during the time of Moses, peace be upon him, he was given Torah, the laws. If they follow that, Moses was the truth and the light. But now the Christians, since they are trying to forge their evidences from Jesus, what they have heard from centuries, now they were trying to put words at how they like. So in order for us to understand what is the Bible, let us see what is the Bible itself. Jesus is described in the Bible as he could read and write. Neither a single word that he was listening from God, he was writing. Neither he says to anyone to write the gospel. Not gospels, not Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. These are written centuries after him. He could easily prescribe writing if he had not enough time to do that. No, if you say that, that would have recorded it there. Now the Christians, what they produce in the early manuscript, showing that this Greek and the Hebrew manuscript, now you can see in the quick picture, these all are perished. In the footnote, largely accounts for the fact that all the old original manuscripts are lost. The transmission we have here, 
This one is the Roman Catholic Bible. It existed since 16th eleven. Before that, this Bible was not exist. This one was accepted by whole Christendom as the word of God. But these Christians, I believe he is one of them, the Protestant, they threw seven books out of this Bible as that these books have an anonymous author. So as such, they threw these words out of the Bible as a fabrication. This is a fabrication. Now the modern day Christians, you know the modern day Christians, RSV, revised standard version, revised by 50 <coughs> scholars in America, made by the Bible Moody Society. They are telling that this concept of Trinity is not there in the Bible. He was quoting first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. You know, you play how you like. Did Jesus utter those words? The scholar says in the original language, in the manuscript, even what you have today, the translation, is not, is not there. It is invented. Politician in Rome, when Christianity conquered them, the bishops in Nicaea, they sit together and they have imposed this law. Why? Because Rome was divided. So it is much more political. And then <coughs> this, there are verses from St. Paul what he was trying to put forward about the concept of Trinity. Read any encyclopedia of the Bible, encyclopedia of Catholic churches, encyclopedia of any Bible, that this concept is derived and it is invented. And uh, regarding, see, just one example, gospel according to St. Matthew, now who is writing it? Ask yourself who is writing this Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We are using these things as a reference. This reference doesn't give any explicit view. Even though there was something, we believe it can be the word of God. What supports the Quran. Now, dear brothers, this is the Quran. You have never seen, maybe the Christians, what is called Quran, the original revelation. This is revelation, side by side there is translation and commentary also. This commentary, this translation is no longer, it cannot, no Muslims accept this as a revelation. Even though this is translation, this Arabic word, from the time of revolution till today, there is unbroken change. Learn the science of the Hadith and the Quran. You learn that the solid evidences that the Quran have, it is very explicit. It defines what is truth, it defines what is false. So, as I was telling about this joke, that don't take it uh, as a way. They have better understanding of God than many Christians today. And uh, this, is, this is how God Almighty, He wants us to reflect in the understanding of man. That God, see what a mockery are we making to God. If you put God into an understanding of man, He has limitation. God Almighty do not have limitation. And thus, the Bible and the Quran, it goes in some passages all together to give a better understanding of God than the God that we are proposed by the Christian though, that we should believe. My, my brother was, we should believe about the, we believe about the omnipotent God. Ask any Jews today, are they prepared to believe a man as a God? No. The disciples, they were going to synagogue. Does the synagogue have any statue of Jesus? No. From the scriptures we find that these are the practice of the early Christians. But later on, you deviate, you put the word how you like. That is what we have today, and that is what we are going to present in an intellectual way. These are not the word of God, and Jesus, peace be upon him, is the mightiest messenger of God, and he is the prophet of God sent to the people of Ben Israel. And I hope in the further discussion we will see the other references also. Thank you. Um, here comes the second round of rebuttal. And it's still 12 minutes, and we start again. Well, uh, first of all, I want to, or you all to notice the following. If he does not put, uh, take up those arguments he did in the beginning, 
all those arguments which I refuted, I put them in context, showed that Jesus is God. If he doesn't show that I have misunderstood the context, then he should come up here, say, I, I'm sorry for taking verses out of context and distorting scripture. That's one. Two, remember, he said that the Trinity came in the Council of Nicaea, 325. I want you to all go and look it up in uh, objective sources. Don't ask Muslim apology. Check it up. That's a lie. Uh, I can quote many, many early church fathers said that said Jesus is God. For example, Barnabas, uh, writing in the seventh between 70 and 130, said that Jesus, who is Lord of all, to whom God said to the foundation of all, let us make man in our image. Je he believed uh, Jesus is God. In nations, writing in the, in the beginning of the second century, for, wrote a lot about him believing Jesus is God. Oh, I can mention a lot of early church fathers, long, just precisely after the uh, first of all, claiming that Jesus is God. So the whole thing about the Nicaea, uh, Council of Nicaea is just a big lie. And let's, let me just put one thing straight. Uh, there are some unacceptable arguments here. All arguments that are based on Jesus being the worst teacher of all time, I won't accept. He said that, well, all the messages could say, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the light. No, that's not true, that's wrong. That would be Shirk al Akbar. According to the Quran, God does not share, Allah does not share his uh, titles with anyone, uh, according to the doctrine of Tahid al Asma wa Sifat. So that's a complete uh, lie. And Jesus said, for example, the following this is from John 6 40. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't put on my mic microphone, so I have to do that. Oh, yeah, I did, sorry. And so John 6, 30, for this is the will of my Father, that whoever looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. God wants everyone to look on the Son for eternal life, so Jesus is the object of faith. Jesus is the one that raises the dead on judgment day and gives them eternal life, so Jesus is God. No mere Rasul could say this. Now, he said the following, the incarnation he found it insulting to God, that God was born of a woman and ate and so forth. And I thank you for that objection, because it goes to the heart of how different Muslims and Christians view God. Let us for, for a moment liken God to a great king that everyone adores. One day the king sees his child drowning in a pool of filth and mud. The king takes off his royal clothes and dives into the filth to save his child. The Muslims are people that look at this and say, never, our king would never do such a disgusting and humiliating thing. He would never humiliate himself that way. But Christians are the, uh, look at the same thing and say, say, there's nothing as beautiful as a love that sacrifices everything in order to save the hopeless. Therefore, what the Muslims consider humiliating, we Christians consider praiseworthy. When God became man, suffered and died for us, that makes us love God and praise Him even more because He shows us how wonderful He truly is. He talked about Jesus being born. No, Jesus became a human then, but He wasn't born. Jesus has always existed. For example, we can see Jesus pre existence everywhere. John 8, 23 to 24, Jesus says, You're from below, I am from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. I told you, you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Then in verse 32, Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I'm here. John 17, 5, Jesus makes this clear when he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. John 3, 3, Jesus says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Over and over again, Jesus spoke about his pre-existence. Jesus was never born. He has existed for all eternity. He's God. He brought up uh, his, this point about uh, all prophets being the truth or the nur, and I refuted that, that according to Tawhid al-Asma wa Sifat, no one, people can be called the merciful, uh, be, be, people can be called merciful, but not the merciful, since that's a title for God. It's the same thing with truth. According to Islam, only Allah is al haq Jesus calls himself precisely that. So Jesus is God, even according to Islamic standards. Um, he said the, the thing about Jesus being a shepherd. Look at this. In John 10, 16, Jesus says, And I have other sheep that are not of this flock. I must bring them also, and they will listen to me. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus is our only true shepherd, the only shepherd. Why is this significant? Because Jesus must be God, since according to the Old Testament, God is our shepherd. And Jesus is our shepherd, therefore Jesus is God. Psalm 23, 1. 
He brought up Acts 2.22 in his uh, first opening statement about Jesus being a man approved of God. Well, first of all, this is Peter speaking. We are having a debate about what Jesus considered of himself. But let's look at the verse in context. Peter says, following, Man of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God by, with mighty works and wonders that signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death. Now I want to ask the, the following tonight. Do you Muslims agree that Jesus was crucified and killed? Of course you don't. If not, why are you inconsistent? Why are you showing this verse? Why are you using just a part of the verse but not the whole verse? Do you go like any, mini, mini, mo? I, I, I take this part, but the rest gotta go? Two, Peter says that God raised Jesus from the dead. But listen, Jesus said that he raised himself up from the dead. John 2, 19. So Jesus raised himself up from the dead, which God did, so Jesus is God. Peter actually ends the speech by saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It is the name of Jesus that, forgives, uh, that forgiveness of sins is given. So Jesus is God. And later, in Acts 3.15, Peter says, You killed the offer of life whom God raised from the dead. Jesus is the offer of life. He's the God himself. So the verses you bring up, I put them in context and show you that Jesus is God if you look at the context. He brought up John 14, 28, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. Well, why does Jesus say, you, you heard me say to you, I'm going away and I come to you. If you love me, you will have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Why should the disciples rejoice that Jesus is going to the Father and the Father is greater than Jesus? What is Jesus talking about here? What is the context? But well, let's look. The whole passage is about Jesus going back to the Father. Jesus says in verse 14 that when he's with the Father, the disciples can pray to him and he will answer their prayers. So Jesus is God. Then in verse 23, Jesus says, If anybody loves me, he will keep my words and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. When Jesus is with the Father, He will dwell all believers the same way Father does. So Jesus is omnipresent, hence Jesus is God. Then Jesus says in verse 26 that the Father will send the Holy Spirit in His name. I repeat, Almighty God will send the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now we understand what Jesus meant by the Father is greater than I, if we put it in context. The word greater there is mason, which doesn't have to mean greater in nation, but can mean greater in position. If Jesus wanted to say that the Father is greater than na in nature, nature, he would have used the word kratom, but he didn't. Jesus meant that the Father is in a greater position. The Father is in glory, while Jesus is humbled on earth as a servant and suffering. The disciples should rejoice that Jesus is going back to the Father, to the greater position, to his glory. That's what verse 5 is about. When Jesus returns to his, his glory, he will have all authority in heaven on earth, Matthew 28, 18. He will dwell all believers and he will answer prayers. That's why this disciples should rejoice. Jesus is going back to his throne as God of the universe. I put it in context to show that Jesus is God. Don't take verses out of context. Um, let's see here. How much time do I have? Three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. I put this. Three minutes. Um, he said a lot, a lot of bits about uh, textual criticism and the Bible. May I use your Quran? Surah 5, verse 47. In the beginning, you don't know how to... Oh, I'm sorry, this, this is Arabic. Yes, I understand. Um, he said about the thing about, well, the, the, the Bible has been changed. The Bible, we can't trust the Bible. Well, first of all, that's like uh, agreeing that Jesus did, in fact, consider himself to be God according to the Bible. And... Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm coming to that. And the thing about it is the following. Uh, this debate is about what Jesus considered himself to be according to the Bible. If you say, okay, I accept, according to the Bible, we see it all throughout the Bible, Jesus is God, then okay, uh, but the Bible is corrupt. But the thing you said about the Bible, there was only one Bible. Here's what Surah 5, uh, verse 47 says. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong Surah as well. Surah 5, 47. Let the people of the Injil, that's we, the people of the Injil, the Gospel, judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then such people are the uh, rebellious disopinion. Let the people of the Gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. 
Allah tells us to judge by what he has revealed in the angel. This says the angel existed during Muhammad's time. Otherwise, what is Allah talking about when he's say, telling us to judge by the angel? The angel existed during Muhammad's time. We had it and we know exactly what kind of angel there was during that time. And when we judge by the angel, guess what? Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ has afforded in heaven and earth. He's omnipresent. He is to be worshipped by all. He shares God's glory and honor. He has the highest name of authority so that God Almighty even does something in His name. He's the object of faith. He's the great I am. He's the son of man in Daniel 7 who is to be worshipped by the entire world with the highest form of religious worship. Jesus is the first and the last. Jesus is our Lord and our God. Jesus forgives sins. Jesus is the judge of the world. Jesus is all known. Jesus answers prayers. Jesus owns everything everything. Jesus is almighty. When we do it according to the Quran, we listen to the Quran, we say, yes, Jesus is God. He again came up and said, well, why didn't Jesus just say, I am God, worship me. I answered that you did not refute it. If Jesus had said, I am God, he would have said, I am the Father, which is wrong. If Jesus had said, I would have gone, gone around and said, I am God, worship me, guess what? They would have, he would have been able to serve people and give his life as a ransom. He came to be served, not to uh, came to be served, not to be served. Hence, he didn't do that. You have to refute my arguments before you actually repeat the same arguments that have already been, been refuted. Your every single argument you put forward had been uh, takes us out of context. If you can't put them in context, you should apologize for taking verses out of context and distorting scripture. Thank you. Yes, my dear brother. <laughs> my dear brother was forcing me to put his word on my mouth. See, he was exciting too much to say that I should apologize for the things that I should take out of context. And he knows all the context. That's why I showed and tell him again, if he knows what I have meant by that, is Jesus says anywhere, I am God. Here, in the Bible, I am God, Jesus, his own word. This is a red letter Bible. Everything what Jesus spoke is in red. I am God, or he says, worship me. If somebody says other things, somebody concludes something, Jesus says, are you yet without understanding? Here is my brother. You will find that. And I would give you the, if I know the text, I, you have to assume that I know the context. However much you try to contextualize, see, he, he was referring to me, and I will show you how he could take the things out of context. This is the Quran, and this is the verse. I was assuming that the Christians will use this. See, phrase by phrase, word by word. He was expecting that he knows the Quran. So we have to help him. But look, you are not the one who knows the Quran. This is, let the people of Injil judge by what Allah has revealed therein. No Muslims have any difference in accepting. Continue the next verse. And you read it to by yourself. You go home. You don't have enough time to... But this is what the Quran says. Then we, Allah Azza wa Jal, He sent down the Quran, the Quran, confirming the revelation of Injil before. And we describe what is Injil. Injil means gospel. Jesus, he says, the word that you hear is not of mine, but the word, but the Father who has sent me. That was in Jim. He didn't have Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Neither he was writing any part of gospel. This is gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four gospels. None of them says according to Jesus. This is according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke. That is what is we are referring to in Jim. Anyway, it's better for the audience to know what does mean by that, that Quran permit the people of Injil to judge by what is there in their own scripture. In the Islamic state, see the system and the understanding, the tolerance of Islam. You're allowed to have a separate court of law what, when you go to judge, if you commit a crime. So in Islamic state, you're allowed to judge according to your own scriptures. If among yourself. You don't know the chronology of the Bible. He was telling that, look, 
Asma of Sifa. Nobody people know what is Asma of Sifa. The attributes and the title of God Almighty, it cannot be given to his creation. I want a single phrase in the Quran by my brother. Show me. He says, Allah says this is his attribute. He, he missed his attribute. His attribute is Allah, his attribute is Ar-Rahman, his attribute is Ar-Rahim. Where is this attribute is given to Jesus? Any attributes out of the 99 unique attributes of God given to the Quran and the Hadith, none of them have con confirmed that Jesus is God. Allah says, He is my servant. And I showed you the verses. If you like to see it again, you can. Dear brothers, you have misunderstood the revelation. God Almighty, He does not speak to Mark, Matthew, Luke and John or any one of us. He chooses man and that man is called messenger. That's why Jesus says, you have neither heard his voice nor you have seen his vision. I am a messenger. Whatever God said to me, I am confirming that. He is telling me I am quoting out of context when Philip says or Thomas says, my God, my Lord. See. Jesus is telling Mary Magdalene that when he was supposed to be arisen from the dead, he's telling Mary, go to my brother and tell them, I am going to my God and your God, to my Lord and your Lord. John chapter 20 verse 17. Read there in a phrase why he is referring to him, my God and your Lord. And he was telling that the, Thomas says, my God, my Lord. Every court of law in the Western, Western countries, when you go, into the court. You know the court, there are lawyers, there are judges. Everyone is telling, may Lord, may Lord, hundred times a day. Does that mean that judge who is judging, is he become a God? No. So what does here it refers to? Bible, the word in Mark, what it says, Lord, in Matthew, it becomes Father. You change the word how do you like. So Jesus, he was telling to his disciple, I'm quoting John chapter 14, verse 1 to 14. He just only quote, God, my God, my Lord. Thomas, what is the before and after? In my father's mansion, beginning from the first verses, in my father's mansion, there are many mansions. Meaning, in the heaven, there are many mansions for the others. I am going there to my father, to my father, to prepare a place for you. So if their understanding was that Jesus is God, so... What does Thomas and Philip say? Thomas says, Rabbi, in the Hebrew tongue, Rabbi means Master, show us thy Lord. Show us thy Father, that is sufficient for us. If their understanding is they are seeing the Father, why would they say, show us thy Father, that is sufficient for us? So Jesus is telling, knowing not that I am in Father, and Father is in me, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto my father except through me. Meaning, the law that the commandment I am giving from God is the way to reach to God. You can never see him, not heard his voice. I am the one who is speaking on his behalf. That was the understanding of the context. If I am misquoting, you should correct me and I would definitely apologize for that. Is this the correction, my dear brother? Is this the context? Or I should open the Bible and hear and read it from 1 to 14. He can read it, and if anyone challenge me, I will accept the apologies that I misquoted him. Yeah, can you read it now? Because the father yes, says yes, now. we can do it on the question and answer. The Bible is here, you can take it, and you come there, that look, this is what you have misquoted. John chapter 14, verse 1 to 14. Here is the Bible, any Bible you like, or you have your own Bible, you take it. Now, regarding the understanding of the Injil, we know Injil was given to Jesus. Whatever he spoke, that was Injil. Quran, it tells us, O oh people of the scripture, why you mixed up truth with falsehood? Meaning there is something that is true. And the truth, it confirms by the Quran. What is given to the early messengers is given in the next verse. See, in the other chapter of the Quran, you have to judge the Quran as a whole. Nothing is given to you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, except what has given to the messengers before. See, what is the message that the God is giving? That we did not send the messengers before you, O Muhammad, except confirming the people that I am your Lord and worship me alone. Not worship Jesus, not worship Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon them all. And regarding this book, the Bible, see the Quran, how it is cursing the people who attributed this book to the book of God. 
People who claim that they saw a vision and start writing that this inspiring God is writing this book, God is telling, and this book you are writing in your own hand, attributing to God. Curse be to you. Curse be to you what you have written. Curse be to you what you are selling it for a miserable price. But what is the truth then? The Quran is the Furqan. Is the revelation of God Almighty intact from the time of revelation till eternity. I will tell you another joke. There was debate, Muslim Christians debate for a long time. So the Christian priest and the Muslim priest, someone like me, someone older, maybe 60 or 70 years old. My grandpa tells me this joke very often in his lectures. So he says that look, the Christian priest was trying to convince the Muslims, that, look Jesus is God, Jesus is God. And you know we have uh, our colleagues and others, so the Muslim speaker was sitting and someone comes to him and whispers something on his ear and the Muslim speaker starts to cry. For example, I'm starts to cry. One will be very wondering why Naim Khan is crying. So he comes to me and he, the priest goes to the elderly Muslim speaker and asks him, what happens? So the Muslim speaker says, you know, I have heard from my colleagues that the Archangel Gabriel, he died. So maybe someone like Omid, he will start to laugh. How fool you are, Naim. You believe in Quran, you are a religious man. Does angels die? The answer was the same. So the Muslim speaker, he just says, you fool, you are telling me that, that God died. God died on the cross. Is this the understanding that you are referring to? He is telling that God is so, so that, that a king is taking off his cloth and jumping to the field. If God Almighty is so, this is the understanding of the Hindus. You know, if God Almighty, he can forgive the sins of the people by his own choice. We read in the gospel, you know, there the prodigal son. Son, he goes deviated from the reality. So that he, he comes back to the way of God. So his father sacrifices for him. And God Almighty says, I, you don't need anything from him. God Almighty coming down to this earth to sacrifice for the mistakes by creation, what he created. And he is taking the sins and the field, the word field he is using. God Almighty is jumping to the field and saving his ships. I use the ships, that's, again he misquote. The ship is referring to the disciples. He is using use God for another people outside of his disciples. Do not throw the bread unto the dogs, says Luke. So these are the words in the Bible which we cannot take literally. My father and I is one. I and my father is one. So the Jews, John chapter 10 verse 30, but onward, read onward. Read the Bible, onward. So the Jews starts to pick up the stone. Because they want to make it trouble. Why? Before the judgment takes place, you remember in the gospel, read again and again. The rabbi says, it is expedient for you, for us, that one man shall die for the sin of all. It is expedient. Expedient. Not right or wrong. We want the man to die. We want Jesus to die because they don't like the man. So they want to put either a head or crook. They want him to be guilty. To kill him. So this is how not God never died in the cross and this is how it's not the properties of God. Jesus was a man and we Muslim believe he is still alive. God Almighty, he don't want his servant, his messenger to die on the cross. So Alhamdulillah for Islam that we have a concept that Jesus is a messenger. He's a man like you and me but he's in a higher authority. That's why he says I am the way, the truth and the life. When Jesus is there, he is the messenger. He has all the laws from God. So if you want, if I want at that time to reach to God, I have only way to follow Jesus. And Alhamdulillah for Islam, we believe in him. We believe in everything what he says and God says in Thank the Quran as a part of revelation. So I hope my brother, he will explain the rest where I miss from. Thank you very much. Yes. Now we're going back to Omid again and we have according to the schedule, it's shortened a little bit, so the next two rounds will be 80 minutes each, so you have to be even more speedy. Well, thank you, Naim, for that engaging uh, uh, rebuttal. 
Um, Nain is uh, presupposing unitarianism. He has not proven unitarianism, hence he can't presuppose it. Um, the, the fact that Jesus was a human being, as a human being, Jesus had a God. All human beings has, uh, have got a God. <clears throat> Jesus had to be a human being, otherwise he couldn't present us in salvation. But here's the thing, now we have gone off topic a bit, and that might be a bit my fault when I brought up the Quran. The, 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 the Quran is not actually...